Fabulous. So I think we're ready. Thank you very much for your patience as we test this new technology. And I'm now going to call the association's governance dialogue to order. <laughs> Loud gavel. On your tables are a few scattered copies of today's association agenda, which is also available on your app. It lists the items to be discussed and the amount of time allocated to each. As you can see, we have a rich agenda this morning, so let me quickly review some basic dialogue procedures and then we'll get started. So as usual, we want to have an informal atmosphere for this sharing of different viewpoints. Therefore, this session is not run strictly according to parliamentary procedure. We do, however, have my, my um, super assistant, <laughs> my brain trust, sitting right here, Ann Guyberson, our parliamentarian. So she is, again, I said this yesterday, glued to my side to help me facilitate this meeting. So welcome, Ann, and thank you. I'd also like to introduce the rest of the women sitting up here on the stage. And they will rise when I call their names, starting over here. Susan Danish, AJLI's CEO and Executive Director. Tina Winham, AJLI At-Large Director. Zena Martin, AJLI At-Large Director. And Elizabeth Taminski, AJLI Vice President. Thank you, Carrie. And to Anne's left, Renee Tusi, AJLI Treasurer. Cece Gassner. AJLI Secretary, and Michelle Vaith, AJLI At-Large Director. Other members of the AJLI Board are seated around the room to facilitate their participation in our dialogue. If you have any questions about issues to be raised today or about a formal motion you might want to make tomorrow about an item, please go to the Tech Business Table for assistance. We have timekeepers today, and they are Tom Cavallari, AJLI's production associate, and Michelle Gorenstein, AJLI's VP creative director. Could you please stand? There they are. <laughs> so that we can hear from as many delegates as time permits, we're going to ask speakers to keep your remarks to three minutes max. Michelle will rise and show a blue card when each speaker is nearing three minutes. So she just rose, and you, can saw, you saw the blue card. Okay, great. Tom will keep track of the total time allotted for each agenda item and will rise when that time is up and show a red card. Thank you. So what you don't want to see is a red card. <laughs> <laughs> so also assisting us today, we have tellers scattered around the room who are members of the AJLI Governance Committee and staff. Tellers, please stand and raise your hand so everyone can see you. When you wish to speak, please see a teller who will direct you to the correct microphone. And as you can see, there are three up front. Thank you, timers and tellers, for your work today. For those of you who have been to an annual conference before, you will see that the front of the room looks different. There are three microphones at the front rather than six. And let me just say that you don't want to see me doing this because uh, what we used to do in the past with the six microphones, it was very hard to see up here. Um, I basically can't see anything right now. None of us can because the lights are so bright. So the three mics are going to help us and help you have a productive dialogue. This mic in the middle is wrapped in red lights and it is the center, so it'll be used to request a time extension or a straw poll. Oh, there's the agenda. Okay, sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. The two microphones wrapped in white lights on the either side, use them to speak pro or con or ask questions at the top for, on the topic at hand. So again, all delegates wishing to speak should report to a teller first, and that teller will direct you to the right microphone. If you are presenting a dialogue topic, please be sure to bring your topic form with you and remain at the mic until time on this topic is up to allow you to answer any questions that may arise. We do have a few basic rules to follow during the dialogue. Time, ha time has been allocated for each item on the agenda. To extend the time for discussion of an item, you need to make a motion. And the motion to extend time for an item is in order when the timekeeper indicates that time has expired. To make such a motion, go to the teller and she will guide you. A motion to extend discussion requires a two-thirds vote for passage. 
Time can be extended in five minute increments. This session is scheduled to end at 10 o'clock a.m. with workshops beginning at 1020, so we want to be mindful of your time. Is everyone clear? Please say yes. <laughs> So during the dialogue, some of you may want to propose a straw poll to get a sense of how the delegates feel about an issue. If so, go to a teller quickly to make your motion. If anyone objects to taking a straw poll on the issue in question, we will put the question to a vote. A motion to take a straw poll requires a majority of votes cast for passage. Voting delegates only seated in the front of the room will be voting on any and all of the items today. For all straw polls, we will, we will use electronic voting, unless there is a technical issue, cross your fingers that there isn't, in which case we will use a rising vote. Tellers will not count the rising votes because straw polls are designed to give the proposer a sense of the delegate body, so we'll just do a scan. And these votes are non-binding. Is everyone clear on straw polls? Thank you. So we're going to begin this morning with several reports from members of the AJI board, beginning with Zena Martin, chair of the board's diversity and inclusion committee. Oops, okay, I need to, <laughs> that doesn't look like my, so just don't touch it. Keep going, Zena. Okay. <laughs> That's why I was like, oh, this is not what Officer rehearsal Kerr. looked like last night. Okay. There you are. Fine. Just a, <laughs> thought maybe I missed something. <laughs> no problem. Thank you very much, Laurel. Good morning, everyone. Um, AJLI is committed to being an organization that is diverse and inclusive. Diversity and inclusion work is a major focus for the AJLI board and has been for some time. We value the 100% commitment campaign and hope that every league makes the commitment. It's important. And we are proud that AJLI has developed resources like the Advancing Diversity and Inclusion by Design Toolkit to provide a clear path for leagues. But even with resources, even with a DNI track at the Organizational Development Institutes, even with DNI workshops at every AJLI conference and virtual convenings, some of you have said that you need and want more help. That is why at this conference, the AJLI Board of Directors is thrilled to announce that we are launching the Accelerator Fund. One de definition of Accelerate is to hasten the progress or development of and that's what this fund is designed to do. This fund is designed to provide monetary grants to leagues to accelerate the progress in their work to become diverse and inclusive, a trainer for your DNI committee, a speaker for a GMM, etc. What is it that you need? The 2019-20 league year will be our pilot year of the Accelerator Fund and eligible leagues will be granted up to $1,000. Applications are now open in the governance section of the AJLI website, so we hope that you apply. The Accelerator Fund gift designation is also live in the donate section of the AJLI website, and we welcome donations from anyone. We will be submitting grant applications and speaking to foundations, but we would also welcome referrals from junior league members for potential grants or other donors, which you can make in the governance section of the AJLI website. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zena, and I apologize for my technical difficulties. We will now move on to the next item on the agenda, strategic linkage. The, strategic link the board's strategic linkage committee is chaired by Michelle Vaith, and assisted by Cece Gassner. Thank you, Laurel. One of the AJLI board's primary responsibilities is to link with our owners, the junior leagues. We do that at conferences and through governance visits to your leagues. This year, our linkage efforts have expanded a bit to be a little bit different. 
And when we look at the association, we find that the vast majority of leagues, over 150, are small leagues, which is defined as less than 125 active members. And many are facing membership challenges. We decided to partner with AJLI staff to provide small leagues with support to address your challenges. The board values all leagues, and we recognize that being small does not necessarily mean that you don't make a difference. Hence, the name of your affinity group, Small Leagues, Big Impact. But many of you have told us that you need and you want help. The Small League Fast Track Renewal Plan was developed by the AJLI staff as a do-it-yourself toolkit to provide basic steps over the course of six months that will address a range of obstacles that might be holding you back. That toolkit is readily available on the AJLI website in the resource library right now. In addition, an ongoing series of webinars on this plan, which started in March and will continue through December, are an additional resource for you. Webinar replays are also available on the website in the resource library. We want to reiterate what Laurel said in her State of the Association address yesterday, that we strongly encourage you as league leaders to review this toolkit soon and consider incorporating its steps into your 2019 and 2020 plans. The AJLI board felt so strongly about the small league effort that we also decided to visit a number of the small leagues in person. And so we have reached out to about 40 of these leagues to talk with league leadership about this plan. When we started this outreach, um, sorry, when we shared this outreach at Winter Leadership, many other leagues asked us if we could visit them too. Our visits are going to continue into 2019, 2020, but we know that we cannot visit each and every league. We have been talking about creating a virtual visit and using technology to meet with each other, which would greatly expand our capacity. If you are interested in receiving a physical or a virtual visit in 2019-20, we ask that you complete a governance visit form, which is in the governance section on the AJLI website. And we apologize in advance that we cannot offer, uh, we cannot meet every request. This feedback from leagues who have participated so far in this effort has been really inspiring. One recent comment from an outgoing junior league president sums up one common theme we have heard from participating leagues. This small league fast track renewal plan toolkit and support from AJLI enabled her league to quote, do bigger things with greater impact. Thank you again to those of you with whom we've met and to those of you whom we are scheduled to meet. You have only reinforced what a meaningful organization the junior league is and our shared commitment to create a bright future. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Our next topic this morning is association finances. AJLI's treasurer, Renee Tusi, has a report to share with all of you. Good morning. Good morning. Today I'm going to review AJLI's financial position looking at historical performance, current year results to date, and the latest view of the association's five-year projections. Let me start by confirming that the association's financial position is strong. At the end of fiscal 2018, the association had unrestricted net assets equal to 59% of its annual operating expenses, well within the 50% internal policy. As you can see, over the past five years, the association's net results have ranged from a surplus of $224,000 in 2014 
to a deficit of $37,000 last year. A planned deficit, which was actually $198,000 better than, than planned. During the past five years, revenues have declined by $257,000, or 3.4%. The dues impact of that decline is $279,000, more than the total revenue decline itself, as membership decreased by nearly 6,500 members over that same time period. Several steps have been taken by the association to be less dues dependent and to diversify its funding sources, include, including hiring a full-time fund development staff member and developing other non-dues revenue streams, such as on-brand. While revenues have declined, expenses have stayed flat, in fact, decreasing by $2,000. We have admittedly benefited from low inflation levels, but there have been inflation nonetheless. The association has been committed to running as efficiently and effectively as possible, and to that end, has reduced staff by 14% over the past five years, moved to a smaller office space, renegotiated vendor contracts, and overall has created efficiencies to create capacity for work. At the same time, the association has launched the Abolish campaign, developed the member placement matching tool, issued the small league fast track renewal plan, and rolled out the unstoppable marketing campaign. The association also continues its work in diversity and inclusion, supporting the rollout of three transformation initiatives, and last but not least, putting together six conferences. As I mentioned, the association reported a deficit last year, and as you know, budgeted a deficit for this year as well. This is a deliberate effort to reinvest some of the healthy reserves on hand, utilizing those resources to accelerate progress around marketing and diversity and inclusion. These are the current year's results through March. The last two columns on the right show a comparison to budget. With three quarters of the year finished, AJLI is reporting revenues of $6.6 .6 million, or $150,000 less than budget. This shortfall is fully offset by lower operating expenses, which are $393,000 lower than budget. After depreciation, the net surplus as of March 31st is $2 million, which is $220,000 better than budget. We do expect this positive trend to continue. The latest forecast projects a deficit of $70,000 for the year compared to the budget of, of $93,000 for the year. The five-year projections were prepared at the same level of detail as the internal financial statements that the Finance Committee and the Board reviews each month. I will go over a high-level summary, but just be sure to know that there is much more detail supporting this analysis. You're probably thankful I'm not going to go through that. <laughs> <clears throat> the projections support the Association's current strategic plan that is in place for 2018 through 2021 and are aligned with the priorities included in the service plan that we, was in your call to conference materials and that will be reviewed this afternoon. The results show modest net margins in each year except for fiscal 2021, which is projected at a $48,000 deficit. A potential dues increase of $7 is included as an assumption in fiscal 2022. It is important to note that the potential dues increase assumption is just that, an assumption for financial analysis purposes. There are also several other issues which need to be considered and addressed as part of any potential dues increase. I will cover those at the end of this presentation along with next steps. But whatever the, am the amount, the timing is still a couple of years away. So the potential need has been identified early enough to have time for a constructive dialogue and a collaborative, thoughtful, proactive process. This is a summary of the results of the current analysis. 
Remember, no detail, right? <laughs> Revenue goes from $7.4 million in fiscal 2018 to almost $7.9 million in 2023, a compound annual growth rate, or kegger, having nothing whatsoever to do with beer, <laughs> of 1.4%. Expenses go from $7.2 million to $7.7 million, a 1.3 kegger. Net results range from a deficit forecast of $70,000 for this fiscal year to a surplus of $21,000 projected in fiscal 2023. These are the components of revenue. As you know, dues are and will continue to be the association's most significant source of revenue, ranging from 74% to 76% over this five-year period. As I mentioned, these projections include a potential dues increase of $7 in fiscal 2022, which adds $734,000 in revenue. In terms of assumptions, membership is conservatively projected to decline by 7,500 billable members over the next five years, resulting in a loss of revenue of $322,000 before any potential increase. It is important to note that the association is focused on reversing membership declines. These efforts require systemic change, which takes time and concerted league effort. The transformation models, the small league fast track renewal plan, the new league affiliation process, one membership and the placement matching tool are all efforts that the association has developed to support leagues with declining membership. Oops, too soon. <laughs> conferences. Three years ago, none of our conferences was operating in the black. Conferences were subsidized at various levels, anywhere from $33 per delegate for ODIs to as much as $44 per delegate for annual conference. The goal has been to get to the point where all conferences other than annual conference are breaking even. Significant progress has been made toward that goal over the last three years. We would expect to continue to subsidize annual conferences by about $100,000 a year to ensure we have maximum attendance for conducting our annual business. That subsidy equates to about $165 per delegate, down from the $400 a few years ago that I just chaired. These five-year projections assume that attendance remains relatively constant at historic levels, with some minor increases in winter leadership attendance given the elimination of fall leadership. Investment income has been held flat due to the unpredictability and volatility in the financial markets. Contributions and grants increase about $100,000 over the five-year period. Other revenue lines are relatively small in amount, and increases represent some new revenue-generating ideas, such as opening webinars to non-league members and providing fiscal sponsorship services to organizations in the affiliation process that do not yet have their 501c3 status. Overall, expenses are growing at 1.3% kegger over the five-year period in an environment where the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics forecasts inflation at 2 to 2%, 2 to 2.5% per year. Expenses are budgeted down for next year, then slightly up in 2021. As you can see, there is an increase in expenses in fiscal 2022 when the potential dues increase is assumed to be effective. 80% of this increase is concentrated in three areas. Special funded projects, such as Member Journey, which offer more personalized experiences for individual members. Marketing and advertising to increase external awareness for both the Junior League movement and individual initiatives, such as the Abolish Campaign. And shared services. The Shared Services Task Force has just kicked off and these projections include an assumption that a subsidized back-end menu of services may be provided to benefit all leagues. This may not be the final conclusion of the task force, but is included here as an assumption. None of these is a new idea. You've been hearing about them for several years as part of the strategic plan and other discussions. But given the continued membership decline, there are not enough resources to pay for these 
without a dues increase. League Operations and Learning includes AJLI's conferences, online learning, the transformation initiatives, league consultations, the affiliation process, the Help Desk, and AJLI Awards program. Over the five-year period, total league services spending is forecast to increase by $130,000, which includes the member journey initiative I just described, increases in consulting for the DNI and abolished um, initiatives, and funding to fully develop training and virtual learning opportunities to replace fall leadership. These increases are partially offset by decreases in other lines, most notably the discontinuance of fall leadership. I should note that cost per conference attendee remains relatively flat with no significant increases. The marketing area handles AJLI's marketing and communications efforts, including our annual report, websites, all of our graphics, videos, and materials. Increases here relate to the increases I described a minute ago. The governance budget is the budget to support the AJLI board and the governance committee. These expenses are projected to remain flat over the next five years. The fund development budget funds the work to secure sponsors, partners, and donors. That budget increases 21% over the five-year period as the associated revenue increases 46%. This is the one area expected to add staff in the next year. The executive office, budgets, the, the executive office budget funds AJLI's membership in organizations like Independent Sector, IAVE, and the National Human Services Assembly. This budget declines over the five-year period. And finally, the finance and administration budget increases by $58,000 over the period, as the shared services initiative I mentioned is partially offset by the impact from savings of restructuring our technology model. Any potential dues increase needs to be evaluated in conjunction with addressing a number of other questions which have come from the leagues, all of which impact the structure of association dues. Evaluating the current dues, impact, the current dues cap. Three leagues are currently benefiting from a dues cap in place of about $123,000. Considering a dues subsidy for women on local league scholarships to make sure league membership is accessible to everyone. In a few minutes, you'll be hearing from the leagues who proposed and support an advisory resolution about a task force that addresses this point, as well as other membership issues. That resolution was in your call to conference. The work these leagues have done and their leadership has truly informed the board. We appreciate you bringing up this important issue, and we're so glad we're on the same page and wanting to talk about it. A couple of other issues. Considering different dues amounts for different levels of membership, such as different le dues amounts for actives and sustainers. Currently, emeritus members, those over 80 years old, pay no dues. Should that practice continue? Should we have a lifetime membership category? Pay once and you're done for the rest of your life. <laughs> if so, how, would we, how in the world? If so, how would we develop pricing on that? And finally, many organizations have more frequent dues increases, but of lower amounts. Should AJLI implement a standard automatic increase, such as a dollar every other year? The board has established a finance dues task force to address all of these issues more specifically and granularly. The task force will be led by Olivia Thomas, the incoming AJLI treasurer. Applications for those interested in serving on this team will be available soon. In the past several years, task forces have proven to be an effective and rewarding opportunity for board, staff, and leagues to work together on pressing issues. This approach has been used most recently on the seat of the table task force. Recommendations from the task force would be expected to be presented at next year's annual conference with a vote on dues either next year or the following year in Indianapolis. As I said in the beginning, this is the current working version of the five-year projections. The board, believes in this the board believes that the assumptions used in this analysis are reasonable. But let's face it, you can make assumptions as aggressive or as liberal as you like. 
we have taken the middle ground here. The final, the, the final thought that I'd like to leave you with, these results are not baked. This is not a final conclusion, but a preliminary analysis. There will be several opportunities for your voices to be heard over the coming year so that we are sure to arrive at a collaborative solution that addresses all the issues and concerns that have come up in recent years. This is a lot of material to cover in this forum, and I know it is difficult to digest. We will post this presentation on the website after the conference, so you'll have all the information that was presented for reference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Renee. We are now going to move on to topics that were included in your call to conference. The first topic is a proposed amendment to operational policies approved by the Junior Leagues, Section 1, Management of the External Resolutions Process. The amendment reflects two years of hard work by the Seat at the Table Task Force. This was a task force of Junior League leaders facilitated by AJLI board member Tina Winham. I now invite members of the task force to share their information. And Tina will provide an introduction. Good morning. Hello, I'm Tina Wenham of the Junior League of Northwest Arkansas. I'm currently in my third year of a three-year board term. And I'm the board liaison, as Laurel mentioned, to this task force. There are 11 task force members representing uh, league sizes and geographies um, from all around. I'm joined on stage today by three of them. Andrea Bordeaux of the Junior League of Minneapolis, Elizabeth Keyes of the Junior League of Washington, and Alex Zuko of the Junior League of Sacramento. Good morning, everybody. Collective voice is our external policy. It's a non-negotiable that collective voice be both mission-based and nonpartisan. Past efforts include breast cancer in the 1980s and domestic violence in the late 1980s and late 1990s. It's important to note that historically, our successful efforts, including the two just mentioned, have not been pushed down from the association, but have risen up from the works that the leagues are doing. As many of you know, the current process for adopting an issue is the external resolution process as outlined in the operational policies approved by the Junior Leagues, also known as OPALS. That's probably what you've heard of it as. This process would take an estimated 18 months to start from start to finish and has not been used since the 1990s. Your league may have its own reasons for supporting the use of our collective voice, but as a task force, we believe it is important because it supports and builds on the works that the leagues are already doing. It raises the profile of the junior leagues, especially when coupled with that brand and marketing work that's being done. It ensures the junior leagues have a seat at the table, and it complements our rich history of being leaders and change makers. At annual conference in Memphis last year, we presented our initial findings that collective voice is a potential driver of our mission and relevancy, that our diversity is our strength, that collective voice must be deliberate and principled, and that it would not set up a successful outcome for the task force to identify a specific issue or issues. When we began our work this year, we started knowing that there is, a, there is widespread support for use of collective voice when the resolution calling for the task force was voted on, about 85% of votes cast were in favor. Yet it's been almost 20 years since we had an external policy. What we honed in on that the current process in the OPALS is not well known and it's labor intensive. There are scenarios where that in-depth process, excuse me, <coughs> is appropriate, but for quickly developing stories and issues, there is a need for a faster response. An issue that we kept coming back to in our discussion is the kidnapping of the Nigerian schoolgirls by Boko Haram. So many leagues are doing work already to prevent human trafficking and slavery or on girls' education or on the welfare of women and children. And those could be natural parallels, but in the estimated 18 months it would take to complete the external resolution process, we've lost our ability to, to lead or even be participating in the conversation. 
With that as a background, the task force presented and collected feedback on the idea of incorporating a rapid response mechanism into OPALS. What we learned from all of you is that there continues to be strong support both for using our collective's voice and for having a faster way to exercise that voice. We've learned that on the subject of approval of rapid response, leagues were pretty evenly split about half wanting leagues to be able to weigh in and the other half wanting to leave approval entirely to the AJLI board as a governance decision. In either scenario, league approval or board approval, there is overwhelming preference for leagues to be able to provide feedback and for that feedback to be collected electronically, whether it be by email, digital cheetah, or some other mechanism, rather than having to wait for an in-person meeting. As a task force, we incorporate as much of your feedback as possible into our final recommendation. Good morning. Um, adding a rapid response process to the OPALS as a complement to the existing external policy process is the primary recommendation of this task force. We believe this is the best way to allow a more nimble response to current and emerging issues while also balancing the need to be thoughtful in how we exercise our collective voice. We've outlined here how the process would work. There would be a new committee, the Issues Committee, on the AJLI board. A proposer could propose an issue in accordance with submission guidelines determined by the board. The Issues Committee would then decide whether the topic proposed should be considered or not, and if it should be considered, whether it should in fact be considered for a rapid response process or would be better suited for the full external policy process. If the issues committee recommends the topic move forward as a rapid response issue, it would then go to the AJLI president and CEO for review. From the president and CEO, the issue would then go to the leagues for their direction. The wording in this section of the amendment the use of the word direction, calling for responses from at least 50% of leagues and favorable opinions from at least two-thirds, is very intentional and is designed to be a compromise that honors the concerns of those who want league approval and those who want board approval and to thread the needle between those who want a 51% favorable margin and those who want a 95% favorable margin. After the leagues have weighed in, the issue goes to the AJLI board. We included in our suggestions to the board that lack of response be considered. If less than 50% of leagues respond to an issue, that is potentially as telling as if 100% responded. If the vo board votes to adopt the issue, there would be an embargo period when the newly adopted statement is shared with league leaders. It is at this time that any supporting documents or resources from AJLI would also be provided to league leaders ahead of the statement going live. If the board votes to adopt the issue, there would also be an automatic expiration date. Having an automatic expiration date prevents the rapid response process from being used as an end run around the external policy process. It also ensures that rapid response is in fact used for new and emerging issues rather than issues where leagues are already devoting significant time and resources. The question we get from a number of you at this point in explaining the process is what happens when your league has a conflict with or disagrees with a statement adopted. The external policy process includes language specifically stating that no league has to adopt or take action on any policy adopted by the association. In the amendment as proposed, the same language would now apply to both rapid response statements and external policies. Finally, we've included language that requires that the issues committee report out regularly to the leagues. This will allow leagues to monitor how many and what kinds of issues are being proposed through both processes. So we know that this is a room of highly driven women who like to know the details. So we've included a sample timeline here. It is important to note that this is just a sample. The specifics are up to the board but at least it gives you kind of a rough idea of how all this would work. So let's start the clock. It starts when a proposer submits a statement to the issues committee, which would have 72 hours to make a recommendation. The issues committee would send the statement to the president and CEO of AJLI, who would have 48 hours to review. The proposed statement would then go to leagues, who would have three business days to give their direction. 
The AJLI board would then have 48 hours to vote on the statement based on the league's direction. The statement would then be embargoed for two business days before going live. It would carry an automatic expiration date of the following annual conference, unless adopted within 90 days before annual conference, in which case it would expire at the following annual conference. Again, a rough timeline, but we thought it would be useful for you to see that this represents something like 12 to 16 days, depending on weekends and all of that. But, and as in comparison to the potential 18 months for an external policy process. The most significant portion of the amendment is the addition of the rapid response process as a complement to the external policy process, which we've just gone over. But we wanted to point out that this amendment adds the language specifying that any issue proposed, whether for rapid response or the external policy, must be nonpartisan. Previously, the language only noted that a topic must be mission-based. For many of us who are located in capital cities who, or who have worked for members in government, this is a critical piece. As Elizabeth mentioned, we have also taken language from the external policy process that protects league by ensuring that it does not have to adopt or take action on the issue and have applied that to the rapid response as well. Any changes to the external policy process are purely to the structure of the section of the OPALs. We did not change the substance of the external policy process. And with that, we um, would welcome any questions. So uh, thank you, Seat at the Table Task Force. Is there any discussion on this proposal? Please go to a mic. And also, when you come to a mic, please state your name and your junior league. Uh, the tellers can help you go to the right mic. You're getting your steps in today. Hi, my name is Alicia Morris Rudd. I'm from the Junior League of Charlotte, and my question for the committee is, uh, who, what members would make up the issues committee at the very first stage of this? Yeah, Tina. That would be at the discretion of the board. Okay. Shannon Kamak, Collin County, Texas. Um, my question is, in response to a particular issue, do you anticipate that the rapid response team would give a quote, I'm, I'm going to take Charlottesville, for example, the shooting in Charlottesville. Would it, take a, would it develop a response specific to that instance, or are you anticipating that it would be more broad and take on a topic like school shootings? Does that make sense? It does. That's a great question. I think it probably depends on what is proposed, because remember, what's being proposed is coming from all of you. Okay. And so if someone proposed a statement saying, um, it was specific to Charlottesville, for example, and that's the issue that's proposed, then I think that it is, is what's proposed. If the issue proposed is school shootings, that's a different issue being proposed. So I think it, and I'm sorry to bounce it back to you, but I think it just depends on, on who's proposing and what they're proposing. Because I was just thinking that the, the league in Charlottesville, the president at the time put out a statement that AJLI then shared and many other leagues shared. So I would think that the rapid response team would want to take on more broad-based issues <laughs> as opposed to we, we support this particular league. Okay. Great feedback, thank you. Just FYI, I'm supposed to go back and forth to the mic, so that's why I keep looking over here. But there's more people here. Yes. Hi, good morning. Um, Lauren Kingston, Kane and DuPage Counties, Illinois. Um, my question relates back to the original ask of the task force. While it was decided that AJLI would not propose an actual issue, um, is there any plan for AJLI to perhaps consider presenting, say, five for league consideration or something like that so that um, some of the leagues that might not have the bandwidth or the resources to propose one, even through the rapid response process, might have an option to kind of vote and you can, 
maybe fast track a, a national um, issue since that was kind of something that we all decided that we needed. Hi, Lauren, and nice to Hi, nice Lauren. to see you after exchanging <laughs> emails. So I think that is that is certainly an option. Also, so as as it stands in both the external policy and in the new rapid response, any league group of leagues, SPAC, Canadian Federation, or the board can propose an issue. And so if there's a concern about bandwidth, there may be several leagues that can work on proposing an issue. Um, you may be able to go through your affinity group to propose an issue. There are a lot of options that we've intentionally left in to try to make it as easy as possible for someone who is interested in submitting an issue to submit one. Thank you. Yes, over here. Good morning, Erica Coopwood from the Junior League of Memphis. Um, in terms of y'all's timeline for getting the information out, how will you, have y'all talked about the process of what point person in each league would be responsible for the information and how do we know that she has received it um, before the timeline expires? Yes, that's a great question. So the specifics of that we've intentionally left broad knowing that that's really going to be something that the issues committee will have to decide. Okay. But we have talked as a task force about whether that means presidents and presidents elect and EVPs or recognizing that there, there likely is more than one person who needs to receive that information in case someone is out of town or just so that we've got coverage and so that leaders are all aware. Yes, okay. that's a great question. Thank you. Yes, over here. Hi, Whitney Punchak with the Junior League of Calgary. Um, you guys have done a wonderful job with communications and consultation on this, by the way. Um, so I have a question relating to section 1.4.2. The last sentence, it says, it is recommended that for adoption, at least 50% of the junior league shall respond, of which at least two-thirds shall indicate support for the proposed action. Um, just given that we've heard that our... Um, with elections and voting that it tends to be a, a low voter turnout among us. I was wondering why 50% was chosen. That seems just a little high. Um, and also related to that is a clarification point is, is not voting then considered dissent for the issue or consent for the issue? That's, that's a great question also and something that we've wrestled with specifically on lack of response and recommending to the board that lack of response be considered as well as response because if you had 10% of leagues respond, that's potentially as telling as 100% of leagues responding. Um, and then as far as the 50%, it really was trying to thread the needle between, it, it was j almost exactly an even split when we pulled leagues of people who wanted the board to have sole discretion and people who wanted leagues to approve and so we were trying to find a middle ground there that keeps as many people happy and invested in the process as possible. Any other discussion items? Hi there, Gabby Wayman from Binghamton. Um, given that 50% of leagues are going to be required for a vote, do we know that enough leagues have a governance process in place to allow for three days to issue a, a vote on a policy? To clarify, it's not specifically a vote. So, because it's, we're, again, we've got 50% right. of you who don't want it to be a vote, want it to be an um, AJLI decision. That's part of why in our sample timeline, we've specified business days for that versus hours, knowing that league calendars get a little bit crazy, you know, if you've got a fundraiser that weekend. But again, the timeline there is, is purely a suggestion that we've made, and yes. so it may be that the issues committee decides we need to give a week for leagues to respond on this, or this we need to give 24 hours, and that would have to be communicated with each issue. Okay, because I know that my board would never be able to have a discussion with a three days notice. Well, and that's, that's an interesting point, too, that I think on the task force, we're really envisioning this as being the president or the president-elect in, in the president's absence, making a decision for her league as a governance decision. I, you know, we've had some questions about from people about sending it to their membership for a vote. And I, I don't think that any of us on the task force envision that at proposal, you're likely to send it to your membership for a vote. It may be that if you d are deciding when to adopt for your league, that you are sending it to your board or to your membership, but the, the proposal would really be, do you as a president or president-elect or EVP or whoever the designated person is in your league, 
think that this is appropriate for the association to adopt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, this microphone. Hi there, Jenny Kite from the Junior League of Ogden. My question is the plan for engagement with media and lending our voice to that national dialogue. Is there a plan of action after that 16 days to um, distribute these statements to media outlets? I, I, I don't, I think that would be a Tina um, or a board question. There's not necessarily a plan in place. However, uh, depending on the issue that got raised, we would be able to, to do so along this process. So we would account for that. <coughs> yes, go ahead. Good morning, Katie Cruz, uh, Junior League of Sioux City. Looking at the timeline, will there be communication from when the proposal is initiated and going through the steps before it gets to the league, or will our first communication be at the point of the three days to start discussing? I think, again, the, the timeline here is really something that we had mocked up, and that may vary based on the issue being proposed. And so depending on the specific issue, the complexity of it, the timeline, I could see that going any number of ways, but I don't think we have set in stone and the issues committee doesn't exist yet, so I know they haven't set in stone what the, what the specifics of communication would look like. And don't get me wrong, I think it's, it's a fine line of how soon do you want to communicate and really start you know, the uproar depending on the situation, but at the same time being a small league that just, I think it's important to start that conversation so we get a feel and have that trial pull instead of caught off guard in three days just there's also so short. And, and please keep in mind, too, that some of the issues proposed may not make it past the issues committee. So um, like, like Elizabeth said, it is kind of an ebb and flow because we don't want to alert everybody every time an issue even comes in the hopper because there is a process that we're trying to put in place to make sure that it is vetted along the way. And so I think as the issue committee vets them, they will, depending on the topic alert sooner or alert once it's kind of made it through some of some of the process and that's absolutely fair I, I would request being a incoming president it would be awesome to know just the different things that are being proposed because maybe there's an idea for my league to then get involved and do you know a project in the um, upcoming year something where I, I understand there's a lot going into the hopper but food for thought, I think it would be great just for the high-level presidents to be aware of them. Yes, and so I, I think we kept this in, but one of the, the proposals is that on a regular basis, it is kind of released all of the things that came through. So if you maybe missed one or if one didn't make it through the process, we're at least aware of um, what's even being submitted because we're hoping things become submitted, but maybe this process Go, doesn't get used either. So it's really kind of testing it out and the idea is to really continue to give updates on a regular basis of how it's working. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, we greatly you. appreciate all your work. So thank you very much. Time is up for this topic unless you would like to vote to extend time by five minutes. Okay, thank you. So we're going to move on to the next uh, yep. may, um, Andrea and I will be available at the end of this session over here, and Andrea and Alex and Tina and I are all in the app, and we're happy to answer any questions that any of you have um, offline. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very, let's give the task force a hand. So now we're going to move on to the next item on the agenda. And the first the next dialogue topic is about establishing a membership task force. That was submitted by the Junior Leagues of Washington, Jackson, and Tulsa. I call on the delegate from the Junior League of Washington to speak about this issue. Please remain at the mic until all discussion has concluded. Thank you. Good morning, Tysley. Good morning, Laurel. Thank you for the opportunity. It's a pleasure being with you. So I am joined by the co-sponsors of what is the advisory resolution, Meredith Aldridge and Mary Beth Nether. Uh, we are delighted to represent 
28 leagues who have signed on to support the advisory resolution. And we'd like to take this opportunity today to frame what the advisory resolution is intended to do and to answer any questions that you may have. We will start by simply saying that an advisory resolution is our opportunity as members within the body to identify and to put forth areas that we would like for the Association of Junior Leagues International to devote human and financial resources to. The advisory resolution that's before you is intended to gain support to research a membership model. The advisory resolution is not calling for any specific recommendation or action. We've just heard from a task force that has been underway, and in the event this advisory resolution passes, there will be a task force formed to further investigate and research and bring back to the body proposed recommendations. I'd like to speak to the beginning piece of the advisory resolution and to provide an opportunity for the co-sponsors to speak to why they have joined in support. We'd also like to take the opportunity to address any questions that you may have. So, the advisory resolution advises the Association of Junior Leagues International Board to research the adoption of an inclusive membership model to address financial barriers which may impede membership. We really want to highlight that this resolution is not about dues. It is about speaking to the current construct of membership, which is available only by paying dues. The reason why we speak specifically to financial barriers is because many of us have experienced incidents where members would like to maintain a membership within our junior leagues and because they don't have the financial means to meet the dues obligation, in some instances they have not been given the opportunity to maintain their membership. So I just want to make sure that we are all clear on the intent of the resolution, which is to research the membership model. I'd like to see if Mary Beth or Meredith have anything. So just FYI, you're nearing your time on this. Okay, are we allowed to take questions? Yes, we'll have questions after your presentation. Wonderful. Thank you. Hi, very quickly. My name is Mary Beth Nesser. I'm the president of the Junior League of Tulsa. Um, and as a, what I would characterize as maybe a mid-size active membership league um, with approximately 260 active members, I saw this as an opportunity to ask for help from AJLI to utilize their resources, their knowledge base, to assist us in researching these membership issues that I know are upcoming for my league um, as we see declining membership, declining sponsorship, and some of the issues that Laurel talked about in her opening statement yesterday. So, thank you. I'm Meredith Aldridge, the president of the Junior League of Jackson, Mississippi. And diversity and inclusion has been a big piece um, of our mission, um, something that we've really focused on over the past few years. And one piece of that, as Tysley correctly pointed out, is financial inclusion, women of different economic backgrounds and abilities to pay. And so we really started talking about this issue. You've heard us talk about this issue. 
at past conferences, we really wanted to bring that issue forward formally to the HLI board to ask them to look at this. Um, the piece of the, that we have suggested does have some specific examples at, at the advice of HLI. We did provide some examples of something that they could look at in the membership task force, which could include a more inclusive membership model that looks at other sources of income or resources that can assist HLI, which will in turn assist all leagues. And I think the one thing that I would like to point out to add to what Mary Beth and Tysley have already said is that this measure is intended to benefit all leagues, and we really want you to think about and consider the overall picture as a broad-based consideration of how we can look at our membership model to include all women regardless of their financial situation. Thank you, Tysley, Mary Beth, and Meredith. So now we have time for discussion on this topic. So if you have questions or comments, please go to a teller or a mic. And when you come to the mic again, please state your name and your junior league. I'm scanning, I'm scanning. Okay, I'm seeing some movement. <laughs> I just have um, oh, Hi, Valerie. Valerie Parkey from Junior League of Fresno. Sorry. Um, I just have one question, which is, would this task force help to inform the information that we saw this morning in the financial projection and that discussion that seems already in process? Is that kind of the goal behind the task force? We both want to answer. So. <laughs> I will yield and Look lift how up their response. We are already. <laughs> um, I think it's it's the best way to think of them is they complement each other. So the the task force that's being projected presented here is broader, but there's pieces of it that absolutely need to inform the finance dues task force. Thank you, Brene. Thank you, Valerie. Yes. Hi, I'm Lauren Chung. I'm the president of the Junior League of the City of New York. As the league with the highest dues of any league in the entire AGLI system, um, we are looking at ways to set up what some of you have already embarked on, which is, um, for lack of a better term, scholarships or sliding scale, and how we can personally build this in um, something like this into our membership model. We could really use um, some recommendations for how to set that up as well as tools from leagues that are already implement, <coughs> excuse me, implementing something like this. We're also curious to hear from, potentially from the task force, how um, AGLI can meet us, particularly large leagues, in terms of the AGLI dues. If we are to offer reduced dues um, from our end, how that can be matched in some way from AGLI. Thank you. Thank you. Over here, is there a question or comment? Hello, Amanda San Martino from the Junior League of Fort Collins, Colorado. I have a question regarding this task force and if any consideration has been given to exploring the overall decline in membership of the Junior League. I'm just hearing from the financial update and the assumptions that are making regarding the decline in membership, if perhaps that is something that should be evaluated prior to looking at the membership model. Um, first, un better understanding the challenges that we're currently facing regarding membership overall. So thank you for lifting that up and highlighting. It is our hope that both of these things will complement one another and that during the process of undergoing research and discovery that we will have an opportunity to first do some fact finding and to also learn how other membership models have shifted. We have largely had the same model since our inception in 1901. And what we are proposing is to determine how we can become less reliant on dues while looking for other opportunities of revenue. So you heard them speak about the fundraiser that was hired. We believe that our collective impact can be leveraged so that we can secure the necessary financial resources to advance our mission 
by augmenting what comes in from dues. So this is about creating space and opportunity for women to join the Junior League, to maintain a membership to the Junior League, regardless of their ability to pay or meet the dues obligation. Thank you. So I just got the dreaded red card, which means that time is up for this topic unless someone would like to make a motion to extend time by five minutes. I'll make a motion. I'm Cassandra Moreno, McAllen Junior League, and considering that there's multiple speakers, I'd like to ask for an extension of time to discuss the topic. So there's been a motion to extend time by five minutes. Is there a second? <laughs> if there's no objection, we will extend time by five minutes. See how Ann just helped me here? <laughs> okay, time is extended by five minutes. We're going to go to this microphone. Hi, I'm Tara Nolan with the Junior League of Cincinnati, and I have two questions for the task force or the people to consider. One, um, as we looked at this in our league, one would be thinking about how leagues could do a parallel exploration process in this that would be in synergy with what the larger task force would be. And the other is to look at beyond dues, what the financial barriers are to participation. So we have found that we have women who don't apply for leadership roles because of the perceived financial expectations of that participation. So um, would just ask if that's been considered as part of this task force. Okay, thank you. Yes, over here. Hi, Thank you. my name is Cassandra Moreno with McAllen Junior League. We actually looked at this issue on our strategic planning process and made it part you know, of our conversation as far as what it costs to be in league. And just as a perspective, we recognize that our league is not, can't be all inclusive for every, every, everybody. Some, we have to have a little bit of dues. So um, there's a lot of choices in participation in uh, volunteerism. And so we make a conscious effort at a league level to make sure that we are not excluding people and we provide scholarships for people. But my comment would be, we can't be everything to everybody. And we need to recognize that dues are just part of our structure. And so if a task force is put together, I mean, I think that there's times when leagues need help to provide scholarships for members. Um, but, you know, it's important that we know that we are who we are. We have, we have dues. I mean, we can't, we have, we are who we are. We have to have a little bit of dues to operate, even within our leagues. So a concept of getting rid of them completely, to me, doesn't make any sense. Thank you. Other comments over here? Yes? Hey, everyone. I'm Zelma Frederick. I'm the president of the Baton Rouge Junior League. Um, I just wanted to comment that our league signed on in support of this resolution because we've experienced um, a surge in members having issues. Our board has discussed for years um, the ability to um, incorporate diversity into our league, but we're having trouble with inclusion. And I think we need to look at all aspects of this if we're going to truly stand up to our DNI statement. Um, I don't think the resolution is meant to wipe away dues because we are a dues, you know, paying organization and it is a large portion of our funding. But in Baton Rouge, you know, one quick example is when we had historic flooding, a lot of our members um, simply that year because they've lost everything could not pay. So it would be so nice in perhaps even limited instances when our league waived our dues for those members who couldn't pay to have AJLI potentially match that. This is not meant to be an across the board proposition, but I think it's wise to look into it before we're faced with a rapid decline over something we could have prevented. Thank you. Okay. Yes. I agree. And I'd like to point out that all the ideas that we're hearing, these are great examples of the many ways that the task force could consider the way that AJLI could help individual leagues. And again, that is all leagues. We are not, I know we're talking about different pieces of it, but we are not calling for any specific action, simply that all these issues, all these wonderful things that are bubbling up in consideration, that they can then be passed on to the board through this task force and will then be um, a way for leagues to receive assistance. 
Thank you. Jeff Tisley? Madam President, may I have one closing remark? Okay. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for the very helpful feedback. Uh, in the event you are interested in signing on to support the advisory resolution, we would love for you to join Operation Inspiration, but you have until 6 p.m. today to, to do so. So if you're interested in joining on as a supporter, uh, joining the 27 leagues who are supporting this formally, you can see any of us and we'd be glad um, to add you. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And also, as a reminder, the governance office hours are posted on the governance office and also in your app. And Susan Danish would like to make a comment. Please go ahead, Susan. I will do that. Ooh, you know when, why don't you come up here? So I just want to say from the staff side of things how exciting this kind of advisory resolution is and how exciting this kind of conversation is. And so I just want to encourage all of you to come to the service dialogue this afternoon where other pieces of the puzzle will be talked about. And I think that all of that makes our conversation richer, makes what we do next together richer. And again, I'm very excited to have all of you come and uh, we have a lot to say, too. Thank you. Thanks for that plug for service dialogue, Susan. OK, so I'm going to move on to dialogue topic number two. I call on the delegate from the Junior League of St. Louis, and she will speak about the, remove, the proposal to remove the geographical areas from the association bylaws. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chairman, Board, and the rest of the leagues. My name is Carrie Gallagher Crompton. I am from the Junior League of St. Louis, and I'm here with other leagues that are helping to support. This is the removal of Article 3 geographic areas from the AGLI bylaws. The request is for the Board of Directors to review the bylaws and consider removal of Article 3 geographic areas. The supporting leagues are seeking league support for this discussion topic, so an advisory resolution may be submitted. The geographic areas are no longer in line with current league practices and no longer serve their original purpose. We are supported by the leagues of Halifax, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, Portland, Oregon, Evansville, Monroe, Fort Myers, and Kansas City. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Good morning, Madam Chair, Kimberly Reed from the Junior League of Kansas City. I have some additional comments in support of this topic. Junior leagues across all four countries are currently divided into six geographic areas. In the 1970s, these areas were established to connect AGLI services through travel and trainings with all leagues. However, since the 1990s, AGLI services have been centralized. In addition, the AGLI Board of Directors and Governance Committee previously held positions that aligned with these geographic areas. In 2012, the, G the Governance Structure Committee recommended bylaw changes. The original recommendation was to remove Article 3 geographic areas from the AJL, AJLI bylaws. Delegates at that time decided not to dismantle the areas, but rather agreed to remove the area designations from the Board and Governance Committee positions. For example, Area 4 Director on the AJLI Board became an at-large director. In conducting research as a part of the Regional Meetings Task Force, which you will hear about this afternoon during the service plenary, it became clear that these geographic areas present challenges and are a barrier toward establishing collaborative league work processes. In addition, the geographic areas no longer serve their original purpose. The formal area positions, as I mentioned, do not serve specific areas, nor is there a service component delivered by AJLI staff through various staff member assignments. The geographic areas do not necessarily consider, consider proximity, travel costs, and other logistics, as many leagues are geographically isolated within these areas. In a time that the association is working to demonstrate more diversity and inclusion, the geographic areas are counterproductive to that initiative. Geographic areas create a false sense of community between leagues that may or may not have anything in common regarding league issues and or community work, and these areas limit potential alliances and collaborations outside the geographic boundaries. Last, 
as our future regional meetings are to be organically seeded, it seems counterintuitive to limit their organic growth by geographic areas that were determined decades ago. Thank you. Thank you. So is there any discussion about this topic? Madam Chair, Lisa Vaughn from the Junior League of Evansville. Since I'm noting that there's no further discussion at this time, is that a fair statement? I'm sorry? Is there no further discussion at this time? I'm seeing if there's any questions for our group. Do you have a question for, about this topic? No, I have a statement if there's no more questions about the. Go ahead. Okay. Our statement is that as leagues continue to embark upon the transformation and as an association, we are incorporating diversity and inclusion. It's important for our documents to reflect those values, practices, and work. So I encourage all leagues that would like to support this topic to visit the governance office located at Plaza Court 2 by 6 p.m. to add your league's name to this advisory resolution. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Lisa. Any other discussion about this topic? Yes. Hi, Katie Shuck from the Junior League of Sioux Falls. And being um, in a very geographically vacant area, um, we're the only <laughs> league in Sioux Falls, and I believe we're the only state that only has one league. Um, I do have the question of whether or not the geographic areas have been considered in future regional meetings, or because so I've been a part of other leagues where we, it's not been like that, but being as a vacant area, what, is that something as we look at potentially developing more regional meetings that that would be used in the future? So would someone from the regional task force, regional meetings task force like to address that? Madam Chair, I can address that question. Great. So the regional meeting task force feel that we should organically let the regional meetings form for what the, the leagues feel are the regions. So having the geographical areas, there have been in the past where leagues felt they could only invite people within that region, and it has not um, c cultivated the inclusion that we are trying to have happen in the association. Thank you. Okay, yes. Uh, Joni Flaherty, Junior League of San Diego. My question is um, related to the inclusivity or exclusivity of um, having regional meetings happen organically. The concern is that some leagues will be left out. Um, for instance, one example is, let's say the Pacific Northwest decides to do a conference and Southwest Exchange continues in Southern California and, um, and uh, Arizona. What happens to Northern California? Um, that's just one example I think they would likely band together, but the question is, especially in other parts of the country where there are not as many leagues in certain geographic areas, wouldn't it be more inclusive to ensure that all of those areas would be represented in a particular regional conference as opposed to having it happen organically and perhaps someone's left out? Thank you for that comment. So unfortunately, we are getting to the end of our session, and I'm trying not to freak out. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, I would really like to entertain a motion to extend time by five minutes because there is another dialogue topic on your agenda. Lori Hohenleitner, uh, President of Junior League of Monmouth County. I make a motion to extend time for five minutes. Thank you, is there a second? second. Without objection, I would like to extend time by five minutes. Okay, so discussion is extended by five minutes. Thank you very much. So let's very quickly move to dialogue topic three. Uh, I call on the delegate from the Junior League of Lufkin to speak about the amending the Junior League mission. Again, I'll ask you to remain at the mic to answer any questions that come up. I've had a lot of informal conversations with um, delegates this week, these past few days. So I, but I don't have any formal like, hey, you've signed on yet, so it's just me. Oh, so. <laughs> oh, okay. So I'm Tracy Nichols. I'm the incoming president of the Junior League of Lufkin. I would like to ask, is it time to look at the current AJL mission statement and possibly place more emphasis on developing the potential of women rather than promoting volunteerism? After attending the Winter Leadership Conference in New Orleans, I was inspired by Laurel and Susan's servant leadership opening and took back with me to the Junior League of Lufkin and to our advisory board the importance of looking closer at our role as a leadership development organization 
through the work that we do in our community and fund, and fund development projects. Also in New Orleans, many incoming presidents, including myself, attended the three R's of legal leaders, for legal leaders, rights, roles, and responsibilities. We learned how we have a voice, and that's where I learned I had a voice. <laughs> The dialogue that occurred in the three R session I attended made the idea of taking a closer look into the mission statement of AJLI, and it tugged at my heart. With emphasis and outstanding job that the leaders, that the junior leagues across the world are doing to develop the potential or developing the pot leadership potential of women, should, we, should this be placed ahead of volunteerism? Even yesterday in the Getting to the Yes, the Art of the Ask session presented by Carol Scott, we heard it stated another way, that AJLI is the premier organization for developing women leaders. And then again this morning in the Governance Transformation Roll-Up Breakfast with Ann Dalton, a question was asked about the roles of the boards when looking at expanding projects. Her response was, does the project meet the leadership development goals of the league? What you did not hear her say was, does this project provide enough volunteer opportunity? Hmm. So this, is, this has become the goal, the model, the mission heard across all aspects of AJLI. So is this possibly the time for us to look at the current AJLI mission statement and consider placing the development, the potential of women before promoting volunteerism, placing more emphasis on leadership development? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Is there any discussion on this topic? Thank you. Yes. Gabby Wayman, Binghamton again. Um, we plan on signing to support this uh, advisory resolution. <laughs> And the, there's a very specific reason why. In the past year, we have uh, gone through a lot of kind of internal exploration of the culture of our membership. And the thing that I have come to identify as the biggest challenge in moving our league forward is that when we recruit, when say volunteering first, we recruit people who want to do volunteer activities, um, who then don't understand the larger strategic impact of the league and are hesitant or even don't want at all to participate in that part. So then we have to have a divided culture where we're like, okay, so we're gonna have four done in a days a month because this group of people really likes to just go to soup kitchens and do stuff with other people. And then there's this other group that wants to do training and wants to know about webinars and they want to talk about five years from now, what is the league gonna look like? Um, and that is such a challenge. <laughs> and all of the diversity inclusion conversations, for me, it all comes down to the idea that the Junior League is for anyone, but it's not for everyone. And we define who gets attracted to us by the way we present ourselves. Thank you. <laughs> Comment over here. Hi, Joy McGaw, uh, Junior League of San Antonio, Texas. Uh, we have, I've, I've been a past membership VP, and so I've seen some of the challenges with our mission statement, especially in that recruitment space. Uh, one of the things that we've done in San Antonio is we adopted our own vision statement that I think helped us to better articulate what it is that we're trying to do in the community. Our vision statement says, we are a community of women realizing our gifts, passion, and purpose. We will advance San Antonio through bold female leadership and positions of responsibility and influence. Mm -hmm. um, repeating that at every meeting that we have, um, having it as part of our uh, prospective member you know, process and members seeing that, posting it at our website, has helped us to articulate that a little bit more, but I think this is a really important thing to bring up, you know, that we have had, um, at least in our league, and I think this probably is association-wide, difficulty with articulating in that sort of elevator speech what it is that we're actually doing as junior leagues to people who don't understand uh, the mission of, JL of the junior league or JLSA or whatever. So um, I think this is a great topic to bring up, so thank you for raising it. Thank you. Yes. I'm just gonna go Elvis style, sorry. <laughs> Five one, y'all. 
Uh, Leslie Bruder from Go uh, Incoming President for Junior League of Corpus Christi. We absolutely would be signing on to this for one major reason. My league next year, two years ago we were in PALS, so we were over 125. Active membership rolling into 2019, 2020 is 50. Y'all can hug me after this. <laughs> we believe, I've been asked many, many times when I say that number, why do you think that's true? And I think this nails it on the head. We, as women, have opportunities that we've not had previously. We can put our time and effort anywhere we want to. What makes the Junior League different? The Junior League will train you in leadership skills that potentially no one else will. And for me personally, and for all of our league, that is where we want to focus, to develop the women who are joining the Junior League, because they can go to Boys and Girls Club, they can go anywhere they want to. I want them to come to the Junior League to develop themselves as well. Thank you, Leslie. So time is up for this topic, unless I hear a motion to extend time for five minutes. And just as a reminder, you can still sign on to the advisory resolution. Yes. Teresa McCormick, Junior League of Minneapolis. I move to extend our time by five minutes. Okay, there's a motion and a second to extend time by five minutes. Unless there is an objection, the meeting will be extended by five minutes. And I think you were next. Uh, Cindy St. Clair from the Junior League of Salt Lake City and? Jenny Kite from the Junior League of Ogden, Utah as well. So we're representing Utah where um, women in leadership is an action issue. We have the lowest wage gap in the country. We have a huge need for women to rise into leadership positions. And we are in a very unique position as a junior league to be marketing ourselves as the place where women are going to get to better places in their careers, in their community, and to lead by example. Yeah, um, through the Junior League of Ogden, in research that we've done in the last year, we've discovered that we're one of four organizations within the state, in addition to the Salt Lake League, um, that provides development for women specifically. So there's a huge gap, and this component uh, differentiates us as an organization from the other community organizations. So we fully support your resolution. Wholeheartedly. Thank you. <laughs> yes, over here. Hi, Michelle Lenz oh. from the Junior League of Boston. I just continue um, to provide the support as well um, in elevating leadership as a key message and a key differentiation of the Junior League. Um, in Boston and Massachusetts alone, there are 34,000 nonprofit organizations all doing incredible um, work out in the community, making a positive impact. But we, just like every other Junior League, are competing for membership, for dues, for donors, for brand awareness, for having a seat at the table. And our true differentiation is our leadership development and our development of the potential of women and the empowering, empowering of women. Volunteerism is absolutely key and vital. It is the vehicle by which we are developing the potential women and the vehicle by which we are training. But leadership is our differentiation, and so we should elevate that message. Thank you. So I once again just got the dreaded red card, so our time is up for this topic. And I know that you want to go to your workshops at 1020. So before we adjourn, I'd just like to share a few announcements. This is in preparation for our annual meeting tomorrow, so please, please go to the governance office and sign on to the advisory resolutions, ask questions of the Seat at the Table Task Force and any of the members who have spoken here today. Just as a reminder, tomorrow, the voting delegate for each junior league must have her badge with the V for voting delegate or the A for alternate voting delegate with her for the annual business meeting, which is scheduled for 10.20 a.m. tomorrow and only those wearing their voting badges may speak. Please, if you're voting delegates, please arrive early to the ballroom, definitely by 10 a.m. or 10.05 to receive and test your electronic voting devices, which we, we will do again. This room will be set up the same way and staff will be here to assist you. If you wish assistance in writing an advisory resolution, please come to the governance office. Two members of the Rules Committee are sitting here. Could you please stand, Elizabeth and Cece? And the Governance Office is in Plaza Court 2, which is just around the corner. Leagues wishing to add or remove their names as a co-sponsor of an advisory resolution to be considered at the annual meeting may do so in the Governance Office no later than 6 o'clock p.m. this evening. 
Let me also remind you that your league's entire delegation, if your league's entire delegation will be leaving before the start of the annual meeting tomorrow, you will need to obtain a proxy form this evening. Please either come to the business table right now or after the session or in the governance office. We'll see you right back here for the Mary Harriman Luncheon. And let me just conclude by saying thank you so much for all of your comments and discussion and questions. This is what we really hope for in this dialogue. Thank you very much. <laughs>